Okay, thank you all for be being with us today. Let me introduce myself. My name is Mina Pham. I'm the uh, current counselor for science and technology at the French Embassy uh, in the United Kingdom. And this is my pleasure to open the second webinar of our series on COVID-19 science and policy. Today's topic deals with COVID-19 and artificial intelligence from unexpected challenges to lessons learned. We are delighted to welcome six experts in the domain who will present their views today. This webinar has been co-organized by our Department of Higher Education, Research and Innovation at the French Embassy, together with INRIA London Programme, which is uh, led by Benjamin Getsch, who will be the moderator and also give a, give a, a, a speech, and uh, together with UCL, and the Franco-British Data Society, which will be presented by Michael Butcher. So without any further ado, I would like to give the floor to you, Michael. The floor is yours. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good, good morning, everyone. I'm Michael Butcher, the president of the Franco-British Data Society. The society seeks to bring together the communities on both sides of the channel with an interest in data and artificial intelligence. Those communities include, include people working in industry, commerce, finance, professionals in all walks of life, not least healthcare, in government, uh, whether as regulators or civil servants, academics, and particularly students, and those starting out on those careers. We are delighted today to be in partnership with the French Embassy, UCL, and the INRIA London Programme. Benjamin. Thank you very much, uh, Mina and Michael, uh, for the preliminary words. Good morning, everyone. Um, we are delighted to welcome you to this webinar. So the second of the ambassadors, as mentioned by Mina, for discussion COVID-19 and AI. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly profoundly disrupted hundreds of lives, uh, hundreds of millions of lives, sorry, in the past 18 months or so. Um, and we seem to be still quite far from putting a lid on, on the sufferings and the restrictions, although the outstanding vaccination efforts are paying off in a growing number of countries. Um, we're interested in exploring the many faces of artificial intelligence, in particular machine learning, data science and statistics, pattern recognition, virtual reality, to name but a few of the topics which our panelists will address in a moment. Um, but AI, in a broad sense, has really been put to test uh, immensely in the past 18 months. So this triggered a number of challenges, uh, whether scientific, uh, on methodology, ethics, logistics, also infrastructure and sharing of data. And some of those challenges were largely unexpected as was the scale of the pandemic. So we aim at unfolding some of these challenges and highlight how some research bodies, in particular the research bodies represented uh, by panelists today, in France and in the UK have tackled the situation. So even though we're not quite over with the pandemic yet, of course, we'll be drawing also lessons from the past 18 months and how AI can be leveraged to, to anticipate uh, future pandemics, uh, whether it will be in six months or in 20 years. Um, scientists, in, in particular virologists and epidemiologists in particular, voiced their concerns for the past decades uh, about what we have been experiencing um, for the past year. But nevertheless, it, I think it's fair to say that the pandemic caught most, if not all of the world by surprise, people and public leaders included. So science and, and scientists have been in the public eye since the beginning of the pandemic and, and millions of people really have grabbed on notions which were invisible in the public debates, such as the reproductive rates of viruses, the vaccine development, uh, the testing and approval processes, ICU management, social distancing measures, and so on. So, so I think we would like to argue, as scientists, is that we have rarely had such an opportunity in recent years to express ourselves and engage with the widest audience and with public leaders. So I certainly think this is an opportunity not to be missed and to, to put science at the forefront of governance decisions and perspective. And in a way, um, to, to allow all citizens uh, to, to grasp the most advanced state of scientific knowledge. So this webinar 
is one of the many examples of, of the science diplomacy efforts uh, which are being led by the French Embassy and we're very delighted to introduce our panelists and engage with you all in the audience. So before we dive into the discussion, I just wanted to give you a few pointers. Uh, so I remind you that the event is recorded and this will be later shared on YouTube channels uh, for the French Embassy, the Franco-British Data Society and in real London. Um, I will have the honor of chairing the whole event. So we have divided this webinar in three parts, uh, which are all roughly of equal length, about 30 minutes. I will first introduce our five speakers and each of them will have about five minutes to present a particular initiative they have led, which relates to the topic uh, of the webinar, uh, and particularly stressing this unexpected challenges and lessons uh, perspective that we adopted. And then we'll move on to a panel discussion for about 30 minutes. Um, and last but not least, we'll have Q&A session. So I would invite you all to register questions on Zoom as of now. So you could see this at the bottom of your, of your screen. Um, you also have a possibility to upvote questions. So please feel free uh, to, to type in any questions for uh, our speakers. All right, um, without further, further ado, I'll, I'll jump on to introducing our first speaker, uh, Professor Geraint Rees from UCL. Geraint is a professor of cognitive neurology at University College London, UCL in London. He's also the Dean of the Faculty of Life Sciences and the Pro Vice Provost for Artificial Intelligence. So as such, Geraint oversees the global AI strategy for UCL uh, and also how UCL engages with public debate on that matter. Geraint, thank you very much, over to you. Benjamin, thank you. That's a very kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. The uh, Franco-British Data Society and the INRIA London programme are, are really important for our university uh, and indeed for our, for our uh, partnership in general. So it's a real pleasure to be here amongst, amongst such distinguished company. Now, I'm, I'm going to start perhaps in a slightly controversial way. I love AI. Uh, as Benjamin said, I have responsibility within my university. Um, for helping uh, generate an AI strategy. And before the pandemic, I spent many hours on this. So I think one of the surprises I have, um, which I hope my fellow speakers will uh, disabuse me of, is that I think AI has had rather less of an impact during the pandemic uh, than I might have expected. We all think AI and data are central to our society and to the futures of our society. And um, so I'd like to ask the question in the first presentation, why is it that it hasn't um, come to save us? Uh, why is it apparently missing in action? Now, the first answer I have to that is that's wrong. It has. My fellow panelists are going to present wonderful examples um, of use cases and, and examples of how it's made an important impact during the pandemic. Uh, and of course, the very fact that we're on these networks, able to communicate and connect um, across time and space uh, like this in a way that we weren't before the pandemic, that is underpinned, of course, by load balancing algorithms, non-stationary noise detectors to filter out the sound of dogs barking. Uh, and our groceries are delivered uh, by uh, routes that are planned through artificial intelligence. So perhaps it's the case that AI has had a really big impact on the pandemic, uh, but it's just not as medical as we expected. Because I think if I look at it from my perspective as a neurologist and a neuroscientist, the three things that have been most important, uh, both in Europe and across the world, um, in getting us to the current state in the pandemic, are clinical trials, gene sequencing, and vaccines. Each of those has delivered fundamental advances in our understanding of this pandemic. And each of those, I would say, universities uh, both here in the UK and in France and across the world have with companies and other people played a fundamental role in getting us to the point we're currently at in the pandemic. It's also interesting that each of those clinical trials, gene sequencing and bioinformatics and drug discovery and vaccines are the kind of areas in which many companies, uh, many academic colleagues are working really hard to think about how artificial intelligence, and in some cases use artificial intelligence, um, to generate the discoveries of the future. 
But that hasn't so much been the case in the current pandemic, I would suggest. So my second kind of comment would be, would be we need to think about why that might be. And one of the reasons it might be is that our current healthcare systems um, in Europe are relatively poorly networked, don't have many electronic health record systems. So my hospital uh, adjacent to UCL, UCLH does, at Mihaela's hospital in Cambridge does, but many European hospitals don't. Um, and their data aren't always networked together in such a way that we can then take advantage of them. So perhaps one of the lessons we might want to learn, and we can go on to talk about that, might be to think about how, that, how we could change that situation. So some of it is all about plumbing and infrastructure. But I think there's another reason as well. Um, and that's that we're now talking increasingly about how AI is having an impact outside the browser, not simply on our social networks and our browsing preferences and our purchasing preferences. Um, but we're talking about using AI in healthcare, in autonomous vehicles, in all sorts of real world applications. And I think those of us who work in that area are acutely aware that the type of people who have the skills necessary to combine both a deep understanding of the domain of healthcare and a deep understanding of what AI and algorithmic advances can do, they're pretty thin on the ground. There aren't that many of those people um, either in the UK, Europe, or indeed uh, the rest of the world. Many of my colleagues on the call represent those experts um, at a national and international level. So we might also like to think um, about how we train those kind of people and how we create the kind of partnerships between different types of organizations. And I think within that, universities have a really important role to play along with national research institutes like INRIA, because they're the natural kind of place that not only train people, but catalyze the coming together of different types of people to solve common challenges, of which the pandemic is one. So I would look um, not just at the current pandemic, um, but in closing, to take some examples from my own university and other areas where we've tried to have this catalytic effect of putting together lots of different companies, organizations, people and pipelines to create, the example here is biological therapeutics. That is um, treatments often for cancer uh, based on um, T cells or these immune cells that we've heard so much about in the pandemic, but in fact are relevant to many types of diseases. Um, our university has been very successful with other partners at creating the kind of networks that have now generated um, many companies, four or five companies that have spun out um, into the stock markets and are now um, creating these kind of biological therapies. In fact, we have uh, so much trial activity um, at our single centre in London, UCLH, uh, that's equivalent to the whole of a rather good European country like Spain. So we have as much activity catalyzed there in that ecosystem. I think looking forward, um, it will be really important to think about, and perhaps we can discuss this on the call, how we can achieve that both nationally and transnationally for these kind of AI in health applications. And just to reiterate, I don't think it's going to be a single center, a single individual, a single company or a single organization that's going to do this. I think it's about catalyzing ecosystems, collaborations, and the type of people uh, that come together. Now, in closing, I'm, uh, as Benjamin said, a Dean of Life Sciences. Um, so I have experts in my faculty who have been writing papers for 10 years uh, and more saying that, uh, do you know what, this biodiversity loss, this climate change, it's kind of making humans come into contact with bats and other animals more frequently. And at some point uh, we might have a zoonotic pandemic. I, I think we all know the answer to that now, we've had one. Um, it wasn't the first, and uh, unfortunately, I don't think it will be the last. And there are more large problems like anthropogenic climate heating that are coming down the line for us to solve. I'm an optimist. So I think using the sort of partnerships we're establishing here and thinking about how AI and algorithms can make people and the planet live together and become a better place, we can work together uh, to solve those problems. So I'm an optimist, but I start this discussion 
with a slight note of self-regard saying, perhaps we haven't been uh, as good as we would like to be with AI during the pandemic. And I look forward to hearing from my fellow panelists that I'm completely wrong. Back to you, Benjamin. Thank you very much, Kiran, for this very pressing call to catalyzing and synergies also across Europe and the world. I think is very timely. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome our next speaker, uh, Emily Chouzenou. So Emily is a researcher at INRIA. Put your spotlight there. So Emily is a researcher at INRIA in France and Applied Mathematics. Uh, Emily is also a European Research Council grantee, uh, and she's been involved in a very successful collaboration with French hospitals in Paris, in particular in the Paris region, to assess the severity of cases. Emily, welcome, uh, and I'll be, I believe you have a few supporting slides, so let me share those as well. Thank you. There you are, the floor is yours, Emily. Okay, great. Um, can you put them in full screen? If, uh possible yeah wonderful <laughs> thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, give my uh, vision of uh, hey hi for healthcare and for sharing this uh, journey of the project uh, scancov ia uh, which is a project indeed involving a collaboration between inria two hospital centers in the paris region and a startup specialized in uh, AI for healthcare in Paris, which is called Okim. And the journey started in uh, March uh, 2020, and uh, we uh, contacted our uh, collaborators from the Institute uh, Gustave Roussy, which is a leading hospital center in Europe for research uh, on uh, cancer disease. We are, we are having already uh, several projects with them on, the, on AI, on uh, immunotherapy, radiotherapy, medical imaging, and uh, okay, we contacted them to say, okay, how can we help as uh, researchers in AI in this, uh, in this crisis? What, uh, what can we do? Or can we work together on a, on a project? And this is how we created this, uh, this uh, amazing consortium of about 50 people. So researcher from our INRIA team in, uh, in Paris-Saclay. So we were uh, three researchers, professors, plus five PhD students. Uh, two hospitals, so Gustave Roussy and another hospital joined us, Kremlin Bicetre, which belongs to this, uh, what is called APHP, which is a group gathering several big hospitals in Paris and, uh, and Okin. And the goal of the project that uh, after uh, discussion we, uh, we targeted was to uh, learn how to predict the severity of COVID-19 uh, disease uh, using artificial intelligence tools from a multimodal data set. That was a, a important challenge of the studies that is to be able to um, gather uh, information from both uh, CT scans, so medical imaging, and also clinical and uh, biological uh, data. So of course, the first step was to gather uh, this uh, data set in a very short uh, time. And uh, of course, given the complicated constraints uh, faced by the hospitals in this, uh, in this period. So we managed to have this data set of about uh, 1,000 uh, patients who agreed to participate to this, uh, to this uh, study. So can you please go to the next slide? It should be on slide two now. Yeah. Um, There's some delay. Yeah, there is a bit of delay. Um, but uh, okay, good. But I, I will start. <laughs> I will start still. So the um, so that was the um, the global goal of the of the study. But of course, we are a consortium, so we needed to define sub uh, sub tasks and or. Um, research tasks as a researcher in uh, AI and especially specialist on uh, AI for uh, medical imaging or task in, uh, in, in RIA was to, uh, was to devise a tool for, uh, for image segmentation. Sorry, because I cannot see the, the second slide. Um, Sorry about that. Let me stop sharing and reshare again. 
So our task was to provide an automatic uh, artificial intelligence tool uh, in order to, uh, to perform the long lesion segmentations in, uh, in 3D uh, CT chest scan. Uh, and that was an important uh, subtask of the whole project because the, the medical assumption uh, behind was that the severity of the, of the COVID cases was probably related to the presence and also to the, to the volume of certain types of lesions present in the, in the lung of the uh, of the patients and we wanted to be able to have a tool that is able to quantify in a very precise manner the volumetry of this uh, of this lesion and actually uh, uh, such tool did not exist uh, so we had uh, our uh, our challenge was to derive such a tool using ai uh, in uh, in, in uh, like uh, maximum one month but in practice it was like in three weeks <laughs> so it was extremely uh, challenging uh, it was a huge methodological challenge, actually. Of course, um, uh, le lung lesion segmentation is a, is a topic that has been already explored in the literature, but here we were facing a first challenge that was a lack of uh, annotations, uh, because in AI, in order to train your method, you need to, um, to have a the maximum number of annotated data. But here, of course, we were in the condition of a crisis, of a pandemic. We could not uh, uh, wait uh, and ask the doctor to spend days to annotate manually some, uh, some CT scans. Uh, so just for, uh, as an information, annotating a full 3D CT chest scan takes eight hours. Uh, so actually, we, we had to do this for about 20 scans, and it was done by a PhD student of our group. But of course, we could not, uh, it was already a huge work for, the, for this uh, student, and we could not, of course, ask this to the doctors. What we ask them is to annotate uh, some small region in order to, for the AI to learn at least what is a, what is a, a lung and what are those uh, different lesions. So our task was to differentiate between same lung and three different uh, kind of lesion which were suspicious in the, in the COVID-19 disease. Uh, the second difficulty was the data set heterogeneity. We had the different uh, uh, brand of uh, CT scans, so GE and CMN, so different type of images. And we had the problem of uh, class imbalance, which is typical in uh, AI for healthcare. Uh, and here the problem was that uh, one kind of lesion was very rare. And so it was even more difficult to learn uh, to segment it. And we faced also uh, practical challenges. Um, first, a challenge which is purely administrative. We are working in a very, very short uh, deadline. So we needed to mount a consortium with a written agreement in like one or two weeks, which is very extreme. <laughs> um, we also had to deal with health data sets. Uh, so it raises several challenges that I think probably we'll discuss uh, afterwards. Our task was a bottleneck for the whole pipeline. So we needed to be uh, we needed to be fast, short deadline, high pressure for the team. And it was also the first time we collaborated with so many people among our team. So it was even more difficult. So for the next uh, slide, I'm just presenting some example of results we obtained for the 3D segmentation. So we are very happy of the result. And the result of the whole study for the prediction of severity were uh, also very positive. So we are able to have a very uh, accurate severity score with respect to several methods from the state of the art. And we had a, a journal paper published in a very good uh, journal, Nature Communication, recently. And we also have an open source software, ScanCovR, uh, which is uh, about to get a, a certification, the CE uh, labelization. Thank you very much, Thank you. Emily, for the thorough presentation uh, and this project, which is being deployed uh, at the very moment in French hospitals. Yeah. Right. Let me introduce our next speaker, Hugues Berry. So, putting on the spotlight, Hugues. There you are. Um, so, Hugues is a research director at INRIA in computational biology. Um, and Hugh is also an adjunct to the Vice CEO at Inaria for Science for the specific themes of digital health and biology. Uh, Hugh has been the co-director of the COVID-19 task force at Inaria, which has been put forward as soon as March 2020. 
Uh, and as such, Uig oversaw the many projects the Institute has put forward since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so Uig, many thanks for being here and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Benjamin, for this very nice introduction. And yes, indeed, um, starting in mid-March 2020, uh, my institute in RIA has set up uh, a task force to coordinate the mobilization of our resources uh, on the battle against uh, uh, COVID-19, and also to prioritize, to prioritize sorry, uh, what actions should be uh, taken first. And in fact, since the beginning, we have decided, I mean, the top, manage, top management of INRI has decided to retarget the whole, the totality of our resources on the implementation of this, of this uh, task force uh, to execute projects uh, starting right now. And the goal was not to uh, dedicate too much time for researchers, for our researchers uh, to respond to calls for projects. So uh, having uh, funding money uh, available uh, immediately. And initially, of course, this, this, this task force uh, supported short-term projects, uh, short-term projects in response to identified requests uh, from uh, actors, uh, actors uh, involved in the health crisis, like clinicians, uh, hospital staff, epidemiologists, uh, public authorities, and so on and so forth. And the aim, of course, the goal was not really to produce research because it was too short uh, a term to, to, for research. The goal was rather to provide operational solutions uh, uh, in the uh, emergency situation of the, of the pandemic. So actually between March and early May 2020, we launched uh, more than 30, 30 projects and of course, at the end, uh, after the end of the first lockdown, so in May, uh, we moved to more uh, medium term projects uh, that became more uh, um, compatible with classical research. Uh, but in total, uh, the, 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 project of, the projects of our task force have mobilized uh, roughly 300, 300 agents, like 300 in total researchers either from INRIA or from our uh, partner institutions and in universities, but also engineers and uh, uh, many uh, administrative staff as well. Um, so those projects, those projects mostly provided, provided uh, operational support to hospitals based on massive data like uh, electronic health records, for instance. Uh, also uh, assistance, so assistance to intensive care units, for instance, or assistance to diagnosis or prognosis for clinicians, just as uh, Emily just uh, just shown. We also, of course, had many uh, 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 projects related to the modeling, the mathematical modeling of the propagation of the epidemics, uh, and uh, even tools related to communication. How, how do we improve communication uh, during lockdown and, uh, and, and confinement? And also that it will be the last item uh, now that I will uh, present right now. We also have been working on contact tracking app. In particular, it turns out that uh, one of our research team called PrivateX, because they are working on uh, privacy preserving uh, computer tools, proposed as soon as March 25, an, imp an information exchange protocol. So a protocol to exchange information called Robert, Robert for robust and privacy preserving proximity tracing, meant, meant for, for uh, a contact tracing system based on exchange of uh, ident cryptographic identifi identifiers like, I mean, uh, uh, pseudonyms uh, by Bluetooth. And that would be that are that is based on the strict respect of the, the privacy framework as defined uh, uh, in the uh, GDPR. So uh, on April 7, so three weeks afterwards, the French government, the French state, decided to choose Robert Protocol as a core building block uh, in the development of, uh, of an official governmental application for contact tracing. And it uh, the, the, the state has designated us in Ria. Uh, for the um, operational coordination of the project that was uh, by the time an R and R&D project involving public and private actors like companies and so on. 
uh, and, and the, uh, the, the French Ministry for Health, for instance. And in, uh, the, the first version of, this, of the application is available since uh, June the second, so June 2, uh, uh, 2020. So that means that in a little less than two and a half months, the project has been completed from start to finish. So we have done the development of a mobile app in two and a, and a half months, a work that usually takes, I don't know, two or three years in the domain, in the field. Um, the code of this application, the code of this application, sorry, that was first called Stop COVID and it is called now Tous Anti-COVID, which means all against COVID in, in, in French, is available, is available in open source. And it, it can be downloaded uh, on Google and Apple stores. And as of yesterday, it has been installed on, uh, on over 16 million smartphones in France. And recently it has even been updated as a wallet, an e-wallet to store vaccination or test uh, certificates uh, uh, for the credit. So I'm telling that because this was the very first time that our, our institute has been implicated in such uh, a, a public crisis, a national uh, uh, emergency crisis. So in many aspects, uh, this was like a, a, a baptism by fire for us, right? Because it was the first time we were confronted into that. And clearly, really, maybe we'll talk that about that uh, next, but it deeply, it completely changed our positioning as a research institute and, uh, and as a technology institute uh, with respect to our positioning in the society and how we uh, interact with the society. Thank you very much, Hugues, uh, for this. Um, Thank you. This story also on the test and trace efforts in <laughs> France uh, and the outstanding adoption also by the widest audience. Thank you very much, Hugues. Uh, we'll move on now to our next speaker, Professor Mihaela van der Schaar. Let me put you on spotlight, Mihaela. There you are. So Mihaela van der Schaar is the John Humphrey uh, Plummer Professor of Machine Learning, Artificial Intelligence and Medicine at the University of Cambridge in the UK. Um, Mihaela is also a fellow of the Alan Turing Institute and a Chancellor's Professor at UCLA. Mihaela is the founder and director of the Cambridge Center for AI in Medicine, and her group has made truly outstanding contributions to healthcare and personalized medicine with machine learning and AI. Mihaela, we're delighted to welcome you, and I believe you also have a few slides you'd like to share. There you are. The, the floor is yours. Thank you. thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you so much for inviting me uh, today. Um, I would like to try to tell a few lessons learned by our group uh, during this pandemic, as well as some of the research that we have done. So early on in the pandemic, already in March 2020, when UK was confronted with COVID-19, I have written a manifesto on what I believed at the time, early in the pandemic, artificial intelligence and machine learning can do to help healthcare systems respond to COVID-19. And six months later, this also appeared uh, in the machine learning journal. And this particular um, topics that I highlighted in this initial uh, manifesto were the use of AI and ML to manage better limited resources, to develop personalized and effective treatment courses for patients, inform policies and improve collaboration, uh, improve clinical trials, and more generally manage uncertainty. Today, I'm going to talk briefly about two of them highlighted here in purple, but if you want to see the research that we have done in our group in this pandemic, please take a look at our website dedicated to this topic. First, COVID-19 at the global level. So early on uh, in April and May, we have started to look at when and how to lift the lockdown that was imposed at the time uh, in the UK. We also have looked not only at um, the impact of these policies on um, deaths, but also on economic impact. And we also wanted to uh, ask questions such as, what was the impact on setting the lockdown at the time that it was set? What would have happened if we would have done it earlier or later? 
And for that, we have built an app and a demonstrator uh, of what the technology can do. Again, this is quite old work now, it's uh, one year ago, but you can see what is possible again at the website dedicated to this. We call this the policy impact predictor. And the problem we tried to address was to estimate the effect of non-pharmaceutical intervention, such as school closures, restrictions, and all other types of restrictions on COVID-19 deaths and conduct a scenario analysis. This is important to inform governments and policymakers on what type of interventions to apply then when, and hopefully this will impact uh, both COVID-19 deaths, but also uh, socioeconomic factors. And unlike some of the work that was ongoing at the time in other institutions, in our work, we looked at a global perspective. So um, we learn across multiple, actually um, 200 plus affected countries. So we learn across the different countries. Um, we were looking not only at issuing predictions, but more importantly, uh, at the effect of different policies, thereby answering what if scenarios and enabling scenario planning on what type of interventions should be implemented and when as well as um, we learn under diverse uh, interventions and as well as heterogeneity across the different countries. Because we know that these different countries are different in terms of both their um, economic system, social system, as well as healthcare systems. And these were existing approaches, which were mainly not based on machine learning, but rather on mechanistic epidemiology models possibly with some machine learning on top of them, but which are calibrated to a single country, focus solely on predictions rather than scenario planning and the effect of policies, and where the focus was mainly if machine learning was applied just to optimize parameters rather than learn effectively across multiple levels. So if we left, you can take a look at our website to see more, but we could answer such questions such as um, what would have happened to the UK if we would have started the lockdown one week earlier, or multiple weeks earlier, or multiple weeks later? What would have been the effect of uh, COVID-19? So we can do predictions in the future, but we can also try to understand lessons learned. Again, this is done one year ago, so this is what you see is uh, June 2020. Um, and, and as I mentioned also uh, at the time in May 2020, a question was when to, lock, when to end lockdown and what will be the effect in terms of uh, lives lost. Um, also, this allowed us to learn across the different countries. And again, different countries are different in terms of uh, many factors. So it enables us what can one country learn from a set of other countries given the, their unique characteristics. Again, more about that uh, at our website on policy impact predictor. We also have joined forces early on in the pandemic together with NHS Digital um, to use machine learning to help hospitals plan and manage better COVID-19 treatment resources. Um, so the focus was on empowering clinicians and managers to save lives during the pandemic by uh, providing a whole set of useful predictions, um, both forecasts of risk, but also use of resources, as well as resource requirements. Again, more about that on our website. But here is um, a publication that we have done a lot later to highlight what has been done and the lessons that we have learned as academics to, by joining forces with uh, NHS Digital. And here is an example of the type of uh, dashboards that we have built, showing days, days on ventilation and predictions in the future. Um, how were we able to do that so early in the pandemic? By using automated machine learning methods that were developed in our lab for many uh, years prior to this pandemic. Automated machine learning enables us at the push of a button to build new analytics at scale. And prior to the pandemic, we have developed a tool called Autoprognosis, um, which is a state-of-the-art machine learning tool which we have used for many diseases, but when this pandemic started, we were able to use it very early on and repurpose it to issue predictions at scale for many factors. This is not only for predictions, but also for 
uh, survival models, competing risks, causal effect inference models, time series models, as well as time series at scale. Um, so now let me go to the lessons learned as an academic. First, I've learned that collaboration is essential and international collaborations are essential. So again, early on in the pandemic, we joined forces with researchers from Brazil, researchers that we have never met prior to this pandemic, to try to understand the effect of ethnicity and, and regional variations in Brazil, which was very highly affected by the pandemic, and developed a variety of predictors to empower um, the researchers in, and policymakers in Brazil. So international collaboration is key. Another one was interdisciplinary collaborations. So it is actually due to this um, pandemic to some extent that we were able very fast in Cambridge to set up uh, the Cambridge Center for AI and Medicine together with our pharma sponsors. But importantly, what is interesting in this center is that we have researchers across machine learning, medicine, and bioscience joining forces to uh, develop research that could be useful in the pandemic, but also beyond. Also, uh, industrial collaborations emerged, and as Geraint mentioned earlier, um, machine learning can play, we believe, a role in clinical trials, not only in uh, developing medication for COVID-19, but also dealing with trials that have been stopped, such as cancer or others. And we would not have been able to do this type of collaboration across uh, industry and academia if this pandemic would not have required that. Finally, um, I do believe that a lot of collaboration is needed among us, the machine learning researchers, and part of that is to enable more reproducible research, such that we can build on each other's strengths to develop faster tools. And an example of that is a system that we have put together early in the pandemic, and so one of our machine learning conferences. But the, the idea here is that we have an ecosystem at scale for clinical decision support. Um, finally, um, we have also learned that implementation is hard. So uh, a machine learning group like mine working with a complex organization such as NSS, NHS uh, is challenging. And again, like Geraint rightly said, education is key. We believe that we need to build a community of machine learning researchers interested in healthcare and highlight the fact that medicine and healthcare are fantastic frontiers that are pushing the area of machine learning. And for that, again, due to this pandemic, I have started in September 2020 an engagement session with research, young researchers from all over the world interested in machine learning for healthcare. So if you are such a young researcher interested in machine learning for healthcare, I hope you can join us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mihaela, for highlighting how machine learning and AI have been key in influencing and helping policymakers. Uh, I think this has been unprecedented at this scale, in particular since the beginning of the pandemic. All right, let's move on to uh, our last speaker, Dominic Kashnan from NHSX. NHSX is the unit to try the digital transformation of healthcare in the UK. And Dominic has led the NHS AI lab through the early days of the pandemic, including setting up the national COVID-19 chest imaging database uh, we'll be discussing. And he's now leading the Imaging for AI program, uh, which has resulted from this effort. Uh, it will also discuss the policies implemented by NHS and NHSX in particular to fight the pandemic. Dominic, thank you very much for joining us and the floor is yours. Very kind of you and what a wonderful introduction. Thanks very much, uh, Benjamin. Um, <clears throat> so uh, first of all, thanks very much for inviting me today. It's an absolute pleasure to be here uh, among such eminent expertise in this specific field. Uh, some colleagues uh, we've been working indirectly with, so I will not uh, overemphasize some of the work we've been doing to date, uh, but ultimately just to talk about some of the work we've been doing uh, during the pandemic. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with NHSX, uh, we are a joint unit bringing together teams from both NHS England and NHS Improvement, specifically the Department of Health and Social Care to drive digital transformation. And it's specifically this unit union which means we're uniquely placed to address the priorities of both central government with a strong focus on delivery. 
It's the NHS Artificial Intelligence Lab that was established in 2019. And our specific mission is around enabling the safe, ethical and effective development and use of AI technologies in the UK health and care system. Kind of a little bit more about the AI lab and our key areas of delivery. We specifically work with our regulatory partners, anybody that's uh, familiar with uh, regulations in digital health technologies and specifically AI. It's made up of acronym SOUP with a number of different agencies. So we're working with these regulatory partners to build a safe and robust environment for the development and deployment. I always stress the word deployment uh, around AI driven technologies, specifically integrating ethics into our AI lifecycle, which is another work package, specifically in patient centered and inclusive ways through research and trialing of practical interventions. We support and develop uh, imaging technology for mechanisms used to safely collect and share and ultimately think about in, uh, validating AI imaging software. We'll come back onto that in a moment. Uh, we also fund promising technologies through the AI and Health and Care Awards. So if you're a technology group or a research group, please do have a look on our NHSX website uh, if you're looking to uh, stand up some of your programs. Uh, so I want to touch on two examples and take up too much time. Uh, of AI being used during the pandemic from NHSX. The first centers on the clinical utility and data collection, as kind of been emphasized by our colleagues, uh, both domestically and uh, in France. And the second illustrates the application of AI for operational purposes and forecasting, also working with collaborators across the academic institutions uh, domestically. Uh, so COVID-19, as we know, has resulted in this in unprecedented collection of health data to support research and coordinating the collab collation of such data sets on a national scale is challenging for several reasons, including issues with data privacy, the lack of data reporting standards, interoperable technologies, I can see people smiling, so we're all on the same page, and distribution methods. And the pandemic has highlighted the importance of collaboration between government bodies, healthcare institutions, academic research, and commercial companies in overcoming these issues. So in partnership with the British Society of Thoracic Imaging, the Royal Surrey NHS Foundation Trust, we set up the National COVID Chest Imaging Database, or NCCID for short, to provide a central repository of chest imaging radiology images for COVID-19 diagnosed patients and controls. The data from the NCCID is already supporting multiple projects and developing AI software to detect COVID-19 in patients, characterize disease appearances, and provide insight on future care needs to improve patient outcomes. The speed with which NCCID was set up demonstrates how the pandemic accelerates existing efforts in the UK to overcome challenges when it comes to large scale collection of medical images. Since its establishment in May 2020, the National COVID Chest Imaging Database has gathered data from over 22 NHS trusts and health boards across England, Wales, and we're also onboarding Scotland uh, currently, obtaining a cohort of over 15,000 patients. And we've learned a huge amount through this project, specifically regarding information governance and processes that must be clarified and standardized to help reduce barriers to NHS trusts participation in data collection exercises. We also need to facilitate much better database linkages to improve the quality, completeness and coverage of the data collected. And finally, we need to define benefit sharing frameworks to help ensure that the NHS benefits at the local level, which will also help incentivize participation in these national data collection exercises. The second example of AI work from NHSX that I want to touch on is the creation of the COVID early warning system. This machine learning tool for the NHS based on Bayesian hierarchical model modeling to warn hospitals so they can divert staff beds and other equipment such as oxygen and ventilators needed to tackle COVID-19 cases. This is a fantastic example as shown by colleagues in the academic world where AI can be applied to provide operational and forecasting support. While this might feel like a less tangible transformation, it is these sorts of tools that can offer much needed system support to help uh, both our health and social care landscape that we know is struggling hugely with resources. Ultimately, we need to move away from the conversations that focus on the potential utility of AI to the value that it delivers today on the ground and having real world evidence. It is important that we are still remembering that we are in a pandemic and we need to continue to respond collectively. And a big part of this collaboration is pooling data sets, research and activities. And like any other tool or technology, AI is only as good as how it is used and how it's created. So to really move from potential progress to optimize the available data resources to moving from training uh, to validation. And this can only be done by industrial scale collaboration as echoed by the previous panelists. Um, 
that's kind of what I wanted to kind of end on, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dominique, for this overview of the efforts of NHS X. Um, I suggest we now move on to the discussion with all of you. I'm conscious of time, so we'll try to finish at 20 past noon UK time to address the questions which are coming in in the Q&A section on Zoom. Um, so I would I would maybe start with uh, linking to what you just said, Dominic, and which also echoes, I think, what Geren touched on, uh, on in the first uh, intervention. And the way that data, so obviously data is key in AI and machine learning tools. And this triggers the question of linkage of databases, sharing data. Geren was talking earlier about the poorly connected network of hospitals and databases in healthcare uh, that we have. Who, who would like to build on this grant maybe? Um. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, there's two ways to look at this, glass half empty and glass half full. Um, so the glass half full is that, for example, in the UK, we have incredible record linkage and world leading databases that connect patients in hospital with their primary care records, with their general practitioners in the UK, uh, and, and increasingly with social care. So we have a sort of incredible breadth and some amazing databases here in the UK um, that tell us a, 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 a little about a lot, a little bit of information about a very large number of citizens. And I think that's, that's the glass half full um, um, uh, aspect of data. Now the glass half empty is, is in COVID, sometimes what we want to know is also a great deal about a rather smaller number of people. Uh, Emily's project, for example, although, not, although that's in France, is an example of how she needed very rich data from a secondary care environment, um, which in the UK would come from, say, in my hospital, an electronic health record. Now, we in London have worked with colleagues in Birmingham, in University Hospitals Birmingham. These are two centres in the UK that have been hardest hit in some ways uh, by the pandemic and by hospitalisations. Um, and we've created a giant database called DCOVID um, of all the electronic health records of uh, patients admitted with COVID and without COVID. It's uh, some staggering number of, uh, I think, 18 million hours of uh, patient observations. Our fantastic data wranglers working with the Alan Turing Institute have put all that, omopified it, put it all together. It's all in a lovely data safe haven. But the truth is that's taken nine months. And we haven't yet been able to complete analysis of that data. And, and although that is amazing, I think, in terms of the effort of the individuals involved and the fantastic contribution by the patients and hospitals, um, at the end of the day, the pandemic is still with us, as Dominic said, um, but I'd have liked to have had it nine months ago uh, and be looking at the answers now. So that's the glass half empty. And the challenge, therefore, Benjamin, going back to you and the panelists, is how can we sort that out so that doesn't happen again? And so it is easy to do this, and, and maybe Dominic and colleagues in the UK, but other um, institutions in France and, and in Europe are gonna help us do that. But I think that's the prerequisite for making progress in the future. Back to you. Absolutely, and I think this also connects to the project Mihaela was mentioning, and, and the fact that, intertwining really data on a global scale rather than per country is key in this pandemic. I, I would um, prefer to, to, to continue with uh, Geraint's point. I think that from a glass half full, from a research point of view, then this question of data and data sharing and how we can uh, acquire better data is I think a glass half full from a researcher's point of view because it pushes us to develop new technologies. For instance, my own lab, as well as uh, others, are working a lot on synthetic data generation with privacy guarantees. This is a research frontier that will enable us to kind of share data with each other uh, without the confidentiality uh, fears we currently have. Another thing, so besides synthetic data, I think another opportunity is to learn what data we should acquire. What's the value of data? So it's not always the more data, the better. It's what type of data we should acquire for whom and potentially in what ecosystem. 
So looking at, again, machine learning methods that enable us to understand value, value of information, value of information over time, how often we should monitor patients, with what type of technologies uh, and what will be the impact, it's another. And finally, for international collaboration on which I'm personally very keen, um, I think there is an opportunity to enable countries to learn from each other. We hear a lot about transfer learning, but it is beyond that. It is um, a technolo technologies that, for instance, have been developed in the UK or France. Can they be transferred to another country and for which patients and potentially with what confidence estimates? So an opportunity for researchers, at least, to think about these problems. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dominic also wanted to... Yeah, if, if you don't mind, I think uh, this, this, play, this plays into a really interesting debate about what is the role of the National Health Service on a front door for secondary use of research? And uh, NHS England, as part of its long-term plan, is building out 23 imaging networks. Um, and the question then starts becoming, if we're building data sets for clinical utility, how do we enable that for researchers so that they can come and do the amazing research activities? And we're not ultimately building multiple, multiple data sets across multiple domestic markets. And one of the things that we've been thinking through, and we're presidency for the G7 this year, and I know that other colleagues I've been involved in these conversations about how do we govern AI and how do we utilize the amazing work that we've done both academically and from a deployment mechanism, taking COVID as a good example, specifically COVID chest imaging, and what are our data sets looking like? How can we share to that exact question of deployment of AI models in various clinical utility and very clinical settings? And how do we take it from one country, for example, France, to the UK or vice versa? And these are things we would love to collaborate on in a more um, process-oriented way. I know that many people are thinking of this through. Um, that's probably kind of key point one. And then also, um, how do we join up to the kind of earlier comments about um, the limited resources capabilities of understanding both machine learning and healthcare? And one of the things that um, came out of the Cambridge, one of the Cambridge teams was a Nature article that also referenced the fact that over 200 literature review, uh, there was zero ML models for COVID chest images that had clinical utility. And I think that opens up a much more interesting conversation. How do we as a community, very at the, um, uh, the borders, but how do we collectively work together to solve some of these problems um, and at a more industrial scale approach to problem solving? So Dominic, I, I really like that uh, emphasis on collaborative approach, and I, I think that extends to data too. And sometimes we in the NHS have a sort of monolithic approach to seeing it as an NHS activity that needs to generate NHS data in an NHS environment. I, I, I'd be interested in your views on that sort of data sharing about a broader ecosystem, because certainly from where I sit, it looks like there are lots of different people who contribute. There's university researchers, there's university research institutes, there's commercial partners, there's hospitals, uh, there's other healthcare settings. So it's, a, it's an ecosystem rather than a, a monolithic thing, but I'd be very interested in your views uh, about that. Yeah, happy, ha happy to talk about that. And I think one of the things here um, is, you know, currently during the pandemic, we have legal mechanisms for all NHS hospitals to share data with us. The challenge really is as zero burden as possible to the clinical staff and to the PACS teams. Um, and that's what we're trying to ascertain. So in the longer term strategic elements of data sharing for clinical use, never mind research, I think these are things that we need to solve. The, those issues also of data sharing uh, have been central in particular in the project uh, that Emily presented. Uh, and I know that Hugh has also been in touch with a lot of partners in France to try and mitigate those issues. Uh, is there any specificities in other France or the UK? Would you say that the situation in France is similar to what Dominic, Grant, and Mihaela just described? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> and, and maybe maybe I'll be a bit, a slightly more pessimistic view than than, than what I've heard before for, about data exchange. First, because each country has a different view of how sensitive are uh, um, have data, personal health data. And uh, yeah. of course, depending on the country, at, at first, if you have GDPR or not GDPR, it's very different. And UK knows that, of course, because uh, obviously you don't have a GDPR anymore. But uh, in any case, that's, that's the first difference. And even in terms of viability, if you look at in the, U in the US, for instance, in the US, most of the uh, hospital data 
have been bought by companies that uh, and the, the 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 data are so expensive that then that even academics cannot afford them or most of the academic labs cannot afford them anymore so there are many many limitations to this very optimist view i think and just a last maybe a last word regarding france uh, another limitation in france is that data are in hospitals but it's 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 been a huge amount of money for the hospitals to calibrate the data, uh, uh, record them, and so on, and store them. And now, the many hospitals see those data as a, a revenue, a source of revenue, and they would like to make money out of that, even if they don't claim it right. Like, but, but uh, and so, it, there are many limitations to this type of um, exchanges. Right. I, I, look, I, I, but I'm going to give the half glass half full answer to that glass <laughs> half empty question, which is, uh, of course, there are many, many challenges. And, and I think that's right, because health data are very sensitive. I don't want anyone on this call seeing my health data. Um, but it's also the case that there are solutions to that. So I, I start from the view that any treatment we're going to produce, whether it's a drug or a biological therapy or an algorithm, has to be globally applicable because otherwise why would you do it why would you create just a treatment that only works um, for the room next door to you in the hospital next door to you um, so that that means we have to think about technologies that do that and of course people on this call are aware there are things like federated learning um, that are attracting a lot of attention and even if it's not federated learning it's about, for example, taking algorithms like Emily said, and perhaps generalizing that to other settings and having networks in which we can do clinical trials and evaluations that test the generalizability of these locally produced algorithms. So I think there's both computational and clinical mechanisms, um, some of which Mahela has pointed out in her articles and the articles from her group that we can think about for how to generalize these. Remember an algorithm in that sense is no different to evaluating um, a drug or a therapy or a complex intervention that we might want to uh, evaluate. And there are millions of colleagues across the world who specialize in doing that every day. So that's the glass half full, which is to say, I think these challenges are important, but we don't need to be necessarily put off by those difficulties because I think there are both technical and organizational solutions that we can work on uh, to improve the situation. Uh, can I just... Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I do understand what you say. Um, again, I'd be a, more, a bit more pessimistic, uh, Grant, because um, I'm not sure... Uh, the, the question will be, if you take... So you have your network that you've trained on your hospital data, uh, and you want to share your network. The question is that, do you have some leak? Do you leak something from your the patients in, your, in the weight of your network? It turns out that it turns out that you can have so-called membership attacks, yeah. and if if you communicate the network, you can know if a if a person has been used to train the network. So, um, and currently those days the, the French uh, regulation for private uh, private uh, privacy called the CNIL is starting to work to to think about what can we say about uh, privacy leaking uh, uh, on those networks. So, so I, I, I totally agree. There's model inversion attacks. There's a whole technical literature on, on, on that kind of information. I think that's super important, yeah. uh, both as an area of um, theoretical research, but also practical application. But, but nevertheless, even if that restricts the domain of possible use cases, we, we've still got things we can generalize across nations. I mean, I, I, I don't know. In my own um, in my own uh, research group, um, a student, Amy Nelson, has worked on predicting, for example, who won't turn up for an appointment. This is a huge problem in the NHS and many healthcare sure. systems where people don't turn up for scanning appointments um, and consequently huge amounts of, of, of time is wasted. And that's a kind of simple principle thing that actually we find operates on quite readily available um, basic personal characteristics of individuals in the, in, in the healthcare system. And we've implemented it in our hospital. We're now looking at generalizing that. That would be an example where we generalize without any personal data. There wouldn't be any big transnational database. So I think, again, the glass half full coming back at you um, is we can make progress again 
on creating the kind of infrastructure that's necessary for making those algorithms uh, deployable, then findable, then evaluated, and then generalized um, across healthcare systems. I can see you're nodding, so maybe, maybe, I've, maybe I've persuaded you, but I, I, I agree with your basic point that there are significant privacy issues that need to still be addressed. Emily, would you like to elaborate? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so first I, I wanted to, to intervene about, uh, yeah, of course, uh, confirming that this uh, uh, data access, uh, accessibility uh, was, a, was, an important, uh, was an important bottleneck. And another point that has not been mentioned yet is that, of course, uh, there is uh, some, uh, uh, at the level of information systems, there is a bottleneck because, of course, uh, the hospitals cannot afford to have this uh, big uh, GPU resources that uh, artificial intelligence is uh, is really uh, needy about, and um, it means that for sure we we need to devise from the beginning of such project we need to have a, a way to uh, make the data uh, go out from the hospital, even if it stays in the country or in the same city. Uh, the, the problem starts from the beginning of the project, even without having big uh, collaboration. Uh, uh, network. So for sure, it's um, it's uh, it's an issue. But I also see this as a uh, with a half uh, with half full uh, glass uh, because I think it also raised a very uh, great methodological challenge. Uh, indeed, it was mentioned about federated learning. Also, why those AI also uh, need the of uh, annotated data set? What about a weekly supervised? Uh, machine learning i think this so uh, this is a very promising area what about something we used in this pro project is uh, uh, using a public data set to train our network and then just uh, uh, fine tune them on our local data set uh, i think it's also important to not be uh, like prisoners of the limitation of the current ai but to uh, to go one step further uh, in the methodology I mean, we're working with uh, mathematicians, statisticians, uh, computer scientists, and I think this is uh, this is also very interesting to tackle those challenges and not to be focused on the uh, on the data accessibility uh, challenge. And another thing, also, what we uh, realize uh, is that uh, indeed the collaboration with companies uh, is uh, extremely uh, valuable in such projects if you want to go until the deployment of the solution, but even from the beginning of the project, for example, in our case, we did some uh, annotation tool for 3D data. And actually it was really key to have this startup collaborating with us and to uh, deploy in like two weeks, a very nice uh, annotation tools that we were not able to find for free uh, in the market <laughs> uh, to be able to move on on our uh, project. So it was also a way to create new tools that for sure should be a uh, really nice to share to the whole uh, to the whole community uh, for the starting of the project until of course uh, the deployment which is uh, not possible to do i think at the only uh, academic level thank you emily um, I'm, I'm conscious of time but also wanted to ask to our panel a question about the pace of research uh, so this has been mentioned by emily and Mihaela uh, already in their presentations but the very beginning of the pandemic was very much using tools that were developed before, uh, because obviously the situation called for extremely urgent and pressing initiatives. We know 18 months into the pandemic, would you say, Mihaela, that um, there is also a stream of work trying to design and elaborate new tools which are specific to COVID-19, and we're moving from using off-the-shelf methods towards more specialist algorithm, would you say it's fair? Well, so, so first, I think that, again, as I mentioned, collaboration among researchers, either interdisciplinary research, as well as collaboration with similar researchers at other institutions, I think has been very much accelerated by this. And in terms of methodologies, I would say um, it showed the importance of building robust machine learning, at least from my point of view, machine learning ecosystems that can be 
easily deployed in such a setting. So I, I don't think as a research community, we talk for a very long time about reproducibility, mm -hmm. but we do not too much about that. And I think that creating ecosystems that are reproducible where people can try each other's algorithms on a new data set that may be only accessible to them is part of the research puzzle. And another piece is um, indeed making this automated machine learning methods um, possible, where um, at runtime, depending on the different characteristics of the data set, these methods can select what algorithm to choose to issue a particular forecast or causal inference prediction or estimation. And, and last but not least, as well known by I think many people here, we also need to have interpretable and trustworthy predictions. So um, I think that that has been significantly accelerated in the recent pandemic because the, the, the interest in uh, machine learning interpretability, um, in developing tools that uh, in, enable us to understand decision-making by machines, but also decision-making by humans. So increasingly we are doing quite a lot of research to understand how humans make decisions and why they make these decisions, as well as all these issues of fairness uh, and access accessibility to resources um, have also become more prominent. So I'm especially liking this idea of understanding variation in practice. And is this variation in practice due to good reasons or to unfair reasons? We have highlighted that together with our collaborators in Brazil, but I would, I'm afraid that this is a more general issue playing an important role even here in Europe. So, and again, machine learning, I think can do a lot, not only to make fair algorithms from unfair data, but also to highlight unfairness of decision makers, human decision makers or institutions. So I'm, um, I'm a big believer that machine learning can be a work for, for good. So, so we know going back to the optimistic, uh, optimistic side uh, of the panel, uh, I very much like this idea of making fair decisions out of unfair data collection, possibly. I think, I think this is an excellent tagline also for the topics uh, that are of interest now. So moving on this uh, and maybe elaborating on what you just said, Mihaela, uh, and before taking questions from the audience, um, is would any of you would like to, to comment maybe on the way that science has shifted gears really in the past 18 months and the way that science and scientists are now more prominently in the public eye and are more uh, in a way present in the policy makers' decisions and, and the way we also project ourselves into a future and, and the way we project our societies into the future. Has this changed with the pandemic, maybe for good? Is this, a, is this a good effect of what has been happening, Geraint, I'd like to intervene? So I, I would hope so. Um, I, I think it was said early on in the pandemic by um, many people at a national level that science is the only exit strategy. Um, and I think that while citizens have played an enormous role in terms of um, um, helping out with compliance with all the national lockdowns and international travel restrictions, at the end of the day, um, as I said in my introduction, what has led the way out of this pandemic and is giving us hope are the clinical trials that have discovered new treatments or, or proven that treatments, some treatments are ineffective as well. Um, they are the gene sequencing of which the UK has been a pioneer along with uh, Denmark and some other European countries in tracing these variants and the family tree of these mutations. That will continue to be needed um, as the virus becomes endemic. And, and of course, vaccines, um, the ones we all know about and the ones that are still in development. Now, all, all of those were produced by scientists uh, working with policymakers at high speed uh, to do something we've never seen before in, in, in the world in terms of speed, cooperation and um, um, togetherness. It was produced, it is produced by a common external threat um, but there are many other common external threats. Um, climate change is one I've highlighted, uh, but there are others. And so I would really hope um, that this does set a precedent um, for scientists and policymakers working together with citizens, because I don't think it's a, it's a technocratic elite uh, that need to decide these things. I, I think it's about setting priorities for citizens and populations and countries 
um, and communities. Um, but I am an optimist um, in, inside all of this. And I do think this provides amazing case studies in the pandemic um, of how we could work together, um, uh, putting uh, uh, collaboration at the forefront of our efforts and science, particularly multidisciplinary science um, at, the, at the core of our efforts. That's been uh, the case for me uh, in this symposium, listening to my colleagues and listening to the questions. It's about collaboration across disciplines and across boundaries and across countries um, and across policy and science. And so I would hope that will continue, but who knows? You know, <laughs> there is out there and we don't know yet. I think that's, that also says it's our responsibility um, to help shape that um, because it won't come about automatically. Uh, it will only come about if a sufficient number of us work together to do that. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, any final word on this topic before we jump to the questions from the audience? Because I'm conscious of time. Yeah, just maybe Good. one yeah. comment, if possible. Sure. Please yeah. Uh, what one main challenge for us has been to uh, for the public to realize that. Uh, scientists always disagree on everything and that's of course that's something that we are used of as as a community as researchers but when it came to the uh, general media to the public and there were completely different uh, opinions expressed by very respectable scientists then it was very difficult for them for the general audience to understand how can can it be and so I think that we, what we didn't do well, what we uh, still have to do is to explain that that's the way science works. And so somehow uh, the public has to, has to accept that and it, it, there's no way to avoid this, this, this situation. And, and uh, my, my, one of the main lessons that, that, lesson that, will, that will draw will be exactly that we still have progress to do in this direction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dominic, for, for a quick final word. Yeah, just I think this is one of the key bits around making sure that we're aligned. I know that there's always going to be conversations about what could be better if. Um, and the challenge for us is how do we set up the frameworks for evaluating AI um, that we come to an agreement on? And I think that's one of our key relationships strategically with France. Uh, specifically with the G7 coming up this summer, about how do we really think this through? Let's take our national COVID assets, specifically around chest, and let's use it as a use case about how we come to an agreement over time about how do we be clear about the evaluation of AI, not just on a regulatory front, but in terms of benchmarking and testing and reproducibility. And I think that's where we're going to have some consensus among us. It will always evolve, but I think the fragmentation of the conversation and the way that we're testing things is going to create more noise versus the signal that we desperately need in this marketplace. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we will now take on questions in the remaining 10 minutes that we have. So um, trying to follow a rough chronological order. So there is one question from Jean-Baptiste Caillot um, to Mihaela, which is, oh, sorry, it just moved. Yes. What was more instrumental to tame heterogeneity of the data, statistics coming from countries, different size, population, way of life, etc. Mihaela? So I would like to thank you for this question, because um, what I'd like to first highlight is that our methodology enables us to understand and learn similarities and differences across countries. However, we did not have uh, uh, collaborators from a social science point of view or policy point of view in this, in this um, um, only clinical collaborators. So I'd like to use this opportunity to extend an invitation to anyone who may listen to us and is interested in trying to unpick these different factors because as machine learning researchers, we always need to be a little bit careful that what we find as being relevant is indeed relevant and uh, that our collaborators and colleagues who know about social science and economics hopefully can join forces with us but from a clinical point of view one of the things that it appears to be extremely important was the differences where the differences and similarities in healthcare systems um, especially with respect to uh, availability of beds ventilators and other types of resources 
in the uh, urban as well as um, suburban setting, as well as more generally throughout the country. And this, this seemed to be a very important um, factor for looking at similarities and differences. Another important factor that we have discovered that's, that's kind of unsurprising was that the way in which the deaths were registered early in the pandemic differed significantly across the different countries. And looking at excess deaths in different countries was done somewhat differently. So, and that had interesting relationship to social and maybe cultural issues as well. So, so I think that the methods that we have developed enable us to, to, to look at these different factors, but I'd like to extend an opportunity to anyone listening who comes from the social science economics point of view to join forces with us to take a look at, at, at this tool together with us to see what we can learn. And I really think that this is still pertinent today because even in the future, even post this pandemic, I do believe countries can learn from each other. And right now, this was not very much done. Everybody implemented their own policies, somewhat in disregard of what has been learned in another place. And from a machine learning point of view, this was great because we could learn from each other. But from a social point of view, maybe it's not ideal. So an, an open invitation. Thank you for, the, for this call for interdisciplinarity and togetherness, which I think is extremely relevant to that context. Another question uh, for Emily um, from Jean Pochilet. Uh, in your experience, what were the major bottlenecks in implementing the project you've presented uh, and delivering the tool to hospitals? Uh, so, so I think I already went, uh, I already kind of answered this question. So for sure, one of the main bottleneck was uh, this, uh, to find a way to work in a very short time that is compliant to the GDPR uh, and still very uh, efficient in order to obtain a result in a very short time. So that, I think that was the first one. Um, and uh, the second one is was uh, I mean the difficulty of the methodological problem uh, due to the lack of uh, of data and annotated data, uh, and uh, and of course the condition of work because we were in in lockdown and it was difficult for everyone to work under pressure. But I think we all uh, went uh, very uh, we went, went stronger after this. Uh, after this uh, project, and we learned uh, we learned a lot, and now we are much uh, stronger also to deal with a new uh, project uh, dealing with uh, AI for healthcare, for sure. Thank you. Another one uh, from Jay Marie: uh, Can AI be effective? A new emerging phenomena as COVID nineteen, where lack of data is a big challenge. Is AI reliable for urgent needs? Would like to answer this one. Big. No, I, I leave the floor to Emily because uh, Emily proved that it was possible to develop an AI based by based system on what three weeks, four weeks. So yeah, I, so exactly. It was in four weeks. So I, I think it's possible to develop something, but for sure that was the deployment and the test in a real condition is very important. And this part cannot be done in an emergency. Then you need uh, to, to to take months and months to check what is happening. And we are also uh, working a lot in our in our team on uh, certification of uh, AI tools, and I think this is really uh, to go to the future of uh, of AI. This is really uh, necessary to have something that is um, stable, that is robust to aerated uh, data, that is more explainable also because uh, this is this is really needed. Uh, maybe a uh, new visualization tools and uh, quantification of uncertainty on the results that was mentioned uh, earlier. So I think we are able to produce results in a, in a short time with few data, but we are like reliable. There is still some work to, to be done. <laughs> but this very is very interesting uh, challenges. Thank you very much, Emily. Maybe one. Uh towards uh, Dominic uh, from Louis Via. Any thoughts on institutions like HDR UK and the Health Data Hub in France on the role to tackle database linkage and privacy issues? Um, so the short answer is yes. I think this is a 
we, we need uh, centralized leadership on delivering uh, mechanisms for access to data. And what are those data sets that people can access? What's in those data sets at a meta level? And I think HDR UK is doing an amazing job with this. Um, you know, there are other mechanisms to go and get access to data through NHS Digital. Um, and obviously NHSX have got some programs as well, NHS England. But, you know, definitely organizations like HDR UK to help coordinate the research communities is key to some of this. Um, does that help? I'm not sure on the French side, it's not, a, it's not an answer I can give. Maybe, maybe on the French side, Hugues, uh, if you have any insight also on the collaboration with the Health Data Hub, uh, because I know that many researchers are also involved and close to that structure. Sure, sure. I mean, same answer than, uh, as, same as Dominic. So <laughs> it won't, right. I don't think it's very different. Thank you. Uh, there's a few questions which have been answered by panelists directly, uh, but, but very briefly, Hugues, if you wanted to elaborate maybe on the Taste and Trace app in France, there was this question from Jean-Baptiste, uh, which is basically what's next for the Test and Trace mm. app in France, to something of it, what's the next steps? Yeah, so, so well, it's not up to me to say because it's, uh, it's controlled by the government and I'm, I'm not part of the government, of course. But what That's we it. have done, we, we, we have uh, developed a new protocol called CLEA uh, to facilitate cluster uh, identification uh, based on QR codes and so on, flashing, clock or flashing, in the context of the, the, the beginning of the lifting of the, of the, 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 the lockdown. But this is ready, but uh, of course it's going to be uh, up to the government to decide whether this will ever be uh, uh, included in, uh, in the app or not. And I don't know, at least I don't know if it's going to be uh, inserted. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask a final question, but I see Mihaela is typing an answer to it. Uh, I don't know if Mihaela, you'd like to, to elaborate on this. Oh, trying to yeah, find the so question again. A, yeah, from Alan Wilson. Yes, so I got Please a question about whether we have looked at the differences within the UK between Northern Ireland, Scotland. And the answer is we are, um, to some extent, the methodology group, we are developing machine learning methods. And I think that these methods that we have developed are able to do so. We have showed it uh, across believe that these methodologies should work when applied at the level of one particular country. But of course, one we need to take them to data, implement, debug, understand differences and similarities. And, and I think that that will be very interesting. And again, we look forward to collaborations. Thank you very much. One final question uh, to Emily from P. Taylor. Uh, we wanted to predict admission for, to ITU from just x-rays. But clinical colleagues are concerned that the kind of patients and visit to ITU has changed over the course of the pandemic. So trying to predict a moving target, is this something that you've experienced, Emily? Um, so not exactly this, because we were working on a very short period, but for sure this, uh, this question of finding a good criterion of uh, severity was very important, especially because we are working on a center on a cancer research. So it may uh, create uh, uh, some kind of um, change in, the, in our conclusions. Uh, so actually what we did is that we, diff we considered three different uh, ways to predict the severity, three different um, outcomes. So including uh, ICU, but also uh, uh, ventilation, uh, death of the patient. And we uh, compared our method to the other uh, competitors on those uh, different uh, on those different scores. But indeed, that's, that was a very important point to, to, uh, to, to take care about. Take care about. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we're coming to an end uh, of this webinar. I would like to extend a very warm thank you to all of our speakers, Geraint, Mihaela, Emily, Dominique, and Hugues. Uh, you've seen also Minha and Michael at the very beginning. I'd like to thank them as well for their unfailing support and help in putting forward the webinar. Um, I'd also like to give a very big shout out to the team behind the scene. Uh, so from the embassy, Rachel Millet, uh, who's also in the list of the panelists at the moment, uh, and Anna Metcalf and Elise Martin, who've been of tremendous help in putting forward the webinar. 
uh, and also Anne Bioche from the Franco British Data Society, who has been instrumental in building everything uh, to host you today. Thank you very much to all of you. Um, thank you for joining us. We certainly hope you enjoyed the webinar. Uh, feel free to share the video. As I was saying earlier, the video will be shared on YouTube uh, on the channels of the Embassy, the FBDS, and INRIA. Um, we certainly hope that you found the discussion interesting. Please feel free to reach out to us uh, if you'd like to have any follow-up conversation on this. And as a concluding word, stay safe and stay tuned for the next ambassadors of the Embassy. Thank you very much.